Hello and welcome. I'm Sam Robinson, psychotherapist in Austin, Texas. I'm here today with Richard Hill as a part of a series of interviews with expert practitioners of different forms of experiential psychotherapy. In this series, we interview a wide variety of experiential practitioners so as to compare and contrast the thinking and techniques of different experiential methodologies. Richard is a psychotherapist, teacher, author, supervisor, and sometimes broadcaster from Sydney, Australia. He is the clinical science director of the science of psychotherapy.net and the managing editor of the port, their quarterly magazine. He is a science director for the Strategic Psychotherapy College in Salerno, Italy, and the patron of the Australian Society for Clinical Hypnosis, Hypnotherapists. Sorry. He has several books, including The Practitioner's Guide to Mirroring Hands and The Practitioner's Guide to the Science of Psychotherapy. In addition to his numerous speaking engagements, he'll have a four-part free webinar series with CollectivelyRooted.com starting March 21st, with details for that being at the bottom of this video. Hey, Richard, great to have you. Sorry I fluffed up some of that intro, but I, I'm sure it was I know, okay. Uh, it's fantastic. I love it. I, I, I actually, I should leave now. I'm sounding good, you know, before I ruin it with my, with, with my dialogue and language. But uh, no, it's great to be here, and I think the series is very interesting. But I think we have to keep doing discussions of, of what's going on because this is the point of the science of psychotherapy. Uh, we don't say the science as in the, the, the reductionism. The science as in the true meaning of the word, which is the knowledge of, and we need to have much greater knowledge of knowledge of about uh, the broader sense of things and of which some we specialize in or have a particular predilection to. This, I think, is uh, is a part of what we're beginning to learn, but what um, you know, Matt Darlitz and I at the Science of Psychotherapy call, and also our good friend John Arden and a few others, uh, the 21st century psychotherapist is actually someone who is um, embedded uh, and buoyed and founded by knowledge and understanding upon which they uh, can quite hap hope for, happily and hopefully happily um, improvise, which then creates it uh, and makes it an experiential framework. And I know that your, your, your expertise is memory reconsolidation. What type of experiential quality needs to happen in order for memory reconsolidation to occur? Okay, so let's get it. So let's say I have expertise in 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 um, memory reconsolidation. I think there are, are greater experts than me. Um, and uh, but I had this wonderful mentor, a guy named Ernest Rossi in 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 the states, and it's very very handy having a mentor who's a genius because uh, you're constantly challenged. And he would say, oh, you've done well in neuroscience. Now it's time for genetics. And oh, and now it's time for, for psychobiology. And oh, now it's time for... We, and we were just starting into quantum. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we'll actually try to say something sensible in quantum uh, ideas. But um, when we're talking about memory reconsolidation, because... You can't just know memory consolidation. You have to know about a lot of things. You need to know a little bit, at least something, about neurons. You need to know something then, actually, about the brain. It would be very handy in memory reconsolidation if you understood something about the anthropology of neural development. It'd be really great if you had that understanding of uh, some understanding of memory per se. Then perhaps some of the interesting people that have been doing these things over the time, Joseph Ledoux, uh, uh, Bruce Ecker, and some of the groups, then uh, Richard Hill, and then it would be interesting and suddenly you're starting to build together and put together a story that is comprised of informational elements uh as different from the other way around where the informational elements are the source for the story the story exists first so where did memory reconsolidation come from it came from evolutionary development out of beneficial uh, uh usefulness for the human species to more successfully survive so no one invented it. Uh, it's been around for a long, long time. What we've done is we've noticed it. And we've gone, hello, that's interesting. So let's get to on that, that started very fundamental. Uh, you change your mind. Memory reconsolidation is the process that occurs when you have insight. Memory reconsolidation is the process where you are able to realize that you got it wrong and now you get it right. Memory reconsolidation is the thing that allows you to not have to go through the 50 things you've learned 
about something until you get to the one that is most appropriate. Suddenly those 49 of them seem to disappear or seem to stop being um, uh, relevant or not stop being accessed. So memory reconsolidation is the process of reconsolidating, reestablishing the memory framework that then becomes the baseline for the next time you recall it. So it's not like you learn something and then you have this experience uh, and then you have this experience, you go back to that, and then you have this experience, and you go back to that. What you do is you have your memory, you have this experience that confirms the memory or it changes the memory or the memory, and this then becomes recorded as a new uh, or a, a, re a reconsolidated or consolidated memory. And the next experience goes back to this one. And this goes, and the next experience goes back to this one. It doesn't go back to that one. That one back here actually ceases to exist in its neural architecture. And the one that exists is this one. So the second part, just to quickly put in here, so memory reconsolidation is the firming up, the alteration, the changing of the neural architecture by which we recall or retrieve the information that we need from our memory. Now, some people will say, oh, but what about this thing, extinction? So, you get, so I'm saying, well, you're getting ahead of the cart, the, the horse and cart a little bit here because that's a therapeutic process. But extinction is the process where uh, you, and I'll explain the difference shortly, but the, where you actually create a new pathway. You still change the architecture, but instead of rewiring or using neural plasticity to re contextualize the memory, you actually create a competitive one. So what we do is you do have traces of the previous memory, and that's in memory extinction. That's where uh, uh, you create an alternative path. So that's that's the two things that are important there. And what's the difference? And why do we have the difference? Why do we have these two elements? Nature's really clever. It says, Sometimes you stuff things up. So I actually have to have some alternative processes, some alternative mechanisms, just in case you don't do the thing the most optimal way. So I have some secondary backups. And in many respects, what we call extinction, where we actually uh, have a, a, a way of behavior, but we create a better way of behavior, uh, is I, I would... My, in my opinion, that's a backup system. That the much preferred system is the reconsolidation where the way in which this network was wired gets rewired into the new way of thinking. So the old way disappears in its nature and context and intensities and the new way becomes the foundational framework and you don't get confused. Because the trouble with extinction is that you have this alternative one. It's an alternative. This is better. We see this in phobias, where someone can get over the phobia. They, they get exposure therapy, and there they are. And then 20 years later, they have another trauma, and suddenly the, the, the brain says, oh, my God, bring out all the trauma-based uh, memory networks, and this one goes, boom, and your phobia comes back. And people go, where did that come from? That was because you didn't reconsolidate it, Reconsolidate it. What you did was you created a more desirable uh, alternative, which is what we call extinction. And what's the difference between memory reconsolidation process and the extinction process? Timing. So, what happens when you recall a trauma, when you recall a memory, when you activate the neural networks that are needed in order for you to have that? Uh, experiential uh, perception is all those million, billion, thousand, trillion synapses and synaptic connections that connect to the, the experience, the past memory, your this, all those different memory elements, they become what's called labile. And in a sort of a oversimplistic way, they literally pull apart and they become available for plasticity. 
So this is the nature. So extinction is plasticity by new development of a neural pathway. Reconsolidation plasticity is where you pull the system apart. Exactly the same thing happens as last time. It comes back together in exactly the same way. You pull it apart, something different happens. You're older, you're wiser, a therapist, uh, uh, you watch a movie, something happens in your life. The system goes, oh, no. And it reconnects everything in a different, it reconsolidates in a different neural architecture. And this is available for somewhere between two to six hours. So I'm talking to you. We're having a fabulous therapy session. Everything's come up. We can see these great things. And, and we're going and we say, now, here's some homework for you. I want you to work on this. So tomorrow, uh, just relax, go home. And tomorrow, uh, sometime in the day, I want you to do this particular homework. Eight hours, 12 hours, 14 hours later, you are now restricted to the process of extinction, of actually creating an alternative pathway. Whereas actually the time to do it was right then and there. Now, here's the secondary problem that we have in psychotherapy is we have a 60 minute, 50 minute hour. Uh, and there's, uh, we can go on. I'll, I'll pause now because I've, I think I've given a, a clear sort of sense of what it is, the differences, and that it's a, to some degree, it's about timing. It's about neurobiological availability of a particular process called reconsolidation. Uh, as different from a different timing where we have the neurobiological uh, process available called extinction. Really, really um, interesting to have the two distinctions. And I guess my first question was, <clears throat> we're not talking about updating the autobiographical memory of, of whatever the thing is, right? It's the It's the implicit meanings knowings and stuff that happened from that experience that we're looking to update as is, is in memory reconsolidation very good um which brings us and we'll we'll have to skirt things a little bit about what's autobiographical memory uh and, and what the nature of it but yes what you've got is you've got your uh, uh episodic memory so you have memory of the episodes memory of the experience uh, which we often call, but autobiographical memory is a is a is a broad is a broader thing. It it, it encompasses a number of things we recall, because uh, we also have our semantic memory, and in fact, a lot of episodes, uh, episodic memory over time gets relegated to semantic memory, relegated to just bits of information that have become dis disconnected, that they disconnect from the the longer story, from the the context. Uh, as we do it and that that's a good thing and a bad thing we can't remember we can't be going through every story of our lives to figure out why the the red vase is our favorite vase so eventually it becomes just more automated more more in the nature of semantic uh, memory um, and so but that autobiographical memory is a collection of relationships between various forms of, of, of memory, of which certainly the narrative memory or episodic memory, as it's called, also the, the semantic memories, also then the, uh, uh, the, the, well, there's procedural memory and there's a few others that, that we use. There's implicit and explicit. There's those things that we, we hold in. We have amygdala-based memories. So we have our uh, sensorial memories and they all come together to produce a sense of our story. And that autobiographical memory is what creates our sense of self. And it's our sense of self that then gives us an experiential um, a, a focal point, a, a point where we can experience our experience. And it's in that space that we, uh, we then feel emotions we then make you know, uh, decisions we then have uh, some things explicit which are, are very motivational we have something implicit negative thoughts positive thoughts automatic behavior so there's a whole lot going on that creates this this autobiography uh, that 
produces our sense of who we are. And it's the intensity and relevance and direct connections, directness of the connections that creates the pertinence of that. So if I have, every time I see my red vase, um, which when I was young, I bought a second one because when I was young, it was um, destroyed in the fire that ruined, that, 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 that killed my dog. Uh, which is a trauma that I've never recovered from. And I buy that vase to remind me of that dog. And every time I see that vase, I have these moments of sadness and, and these moments of, 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 of reflection. But then I find that I'm actually unable to go to work because I'm so sad because that sadness connects with also the sadness of when my grandmother died and uh, when my father was really sick and also the time I got injured. And suddenly you get this network of associations into our episodic and our, some you know, various memories that create uh, uh, from an autobiographical framework an experiential disaster of an experiential train wreck so it's these associations these connections the intensity of them in relation to the uh, to current experience and the way in which we contextualize them in relation to the country the current experience so the thing what memory does is that it can pull because of our our current experience, it can pull our past experience into the reality of our current experience, even if our current experience is not is not the same. I mean, I no longer have the dog. I no longer have all those things. So it is my memory of those things that creates my emotional response. So what we're wanting to do is the dog did pass away. The house did burn down. My grandfather did have the accident. I did all those other things that I've now forgotten that I suggested, but all those traumas, all those um, dissociated, or they might be complex, the same thing. My grandfather died. My grandmother died. Then my father, you know, it could be these collections of things. Or my grandfather uh, used to beat me with this vase. And then I had violence at school. Then I was bullied. So you get complex trauma uh, memories building up. And they have an intensity, an intensity and a connection to the nature of experiences today. And variously, post-traumatic stress disorder is how we describe a lot of those things. So what we want to do is we can't get rid of the memory of the dog or the grandfather or the things, the fire. What we can do, though, is we can alter the nature of the connection, the nature of the way in which that connection presents itself in, in modern life. And if I can reconsolidate my memory of those events, because what's the problem with them? They're in the present. If I can reconsolidate that memory into saying, the house burning down was 20 years ago. The dog dying was 20 years ago. The grandfather passing away was, and this is what some people call timeline therapy. Uh, and there's various other ways we do that. Or uh, de-energizing or releasing you from those thoughts there's all kinds of language that people use but fundamentally they're doing all the same thing they're shifting that memory into being something that no longer exists that doesn't it isn't activated today uh and then you can go yes i remember that that was a very difficult event and what therapy very often does then is it says okay so rather than being damaged and and triggered and injured by that memory what did we learn from it what were the benefits where is it taken us what can we as we say in solution focused therapy what do you do next as different from what did you do in the past and uh there are various other ways I, I i do this with mirroring hands we do this with somatic therapists where we do it somatically rather than um, cognitively cognitive behavioral therapy uh does it if it manages to get itself activated in the in the the, the two to six hour period um and uh and then what we do is we have a reconsolidation where that association of the red vase and the memory of the red vase ceases to be one of direct uh, impact and it becomes a recollection and it's reconsolidated as a past memory 
that can no longer hurt me. And our system has been doing this for hundreds of thousands, if not a million, if not more years. We just lost track of it over our um, over the way in which our our social brain and our uh, cognitive processes uh, can uh, and our uh, implicit processes can get in and mess up the process, mess up the benefits of what we call post-traumatic growth. Mm-hmm. I love it. I had, Does that I had all make a, sense? Yeah, I, yeah, for sure. I, I think my, my question that came up was, what happens if a client comes in, right, and they're like, I have this red vase. I look at it every t- every day. It reminds me of all this stuff I know happened 20 years ago. I know cognitively I'm not in the, I'm not seeing my house burn down with my dog in it and my grandma is not there. I know that was 20 years ago, but the, the, the suffering is still the same. Like if they already have that thread or that whatever to be like, I know this is, I'm, I'm living in memory when I see this vase. Then how does the treatment look for in that case, if that makes sense? Memory reconsolidation is a limited thing. It is an organizing principle of human beings that can be incorporated and utilized and wants to be and seeks to find the opportunity to express itself in almost any therapy you might imagine. So when I'm sitting there with the client, I'm looking, what sort of client are you? What sort of person are you? Because some people are more somatic or in a somatic framework. Some people are in a cognitive framework. Some people are in a subcortical uh, or subconscious, I know people use that term, uh, but a subcortical way. So it's their automatic thoughts. So the therapist's real skill is going, what is the mechanism that this person is going to be most attuned to or most resonant with that I can utilize to uh, assist them in reconsolidating their neural architecture into a way that allows that red vase to exist and be a positive memory and be a pleasing thing. I'm glad I'm remembering my dog and the and the uh, and the burnt things because it's good to remember and that makes me better as a human being. I'm more sense oh yes, I'm noticing my sensitivity. So have you said that, let's look at one of these now is it all if i just jump into one if you've got a question to jump in there Go. well I, I don't know i did want to just say a comment about um it's like you're really talking about there needing to be an experience like some experience which is has the power to reconsolidate this thing not just i'm going to sit right. here and think oh yeah that was hard but it was 20 years ago i'm all right now it's like a some experience has to happen to usher the individual into that yeah and this is the thing someone might come in and go, oh, I'd never thought of it like that. And it's just merely a uh, an orientation, an attitude. That might be enough. That might be enough remembering while they're thinking of it, while they're talking about it, so they're talking about the thing, the, the system has become labile. For some people, it is as simple as that. This is why we have, uh, and, and to some extent, your question uh uh, I'll just mention sort of briefly, uh, we haven't got time to really go into the depths of it, but this is why almost everything can work. A positive affirmation for somebody else. They're just, it's not that deeply embedded and 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 uh, uh, it's just a single thing. It's just a, something and they've just got this negative attitude and I've written a book called The Win or Lose a World that, on the second shelf. Uh, but, um, but that's... Uh, uh that can be done just with a simple thought but then you've had people who do the positive affirmations uh they do things nothing they go back works for five minutes but then so they haven't reconsolidated they haven't they haven't reconsolidated into a new frame what they've done is they've just had an alternative idea oh i feel better now but this thing hasn't stayed they they've been distracted or dissociated or uh, given a, an alternative thought um, but for some, it might be all that's needed. And they go, oh, yeah, Poof. and they reconsolidate beautifully. So there's a lot to do with uh, the nature of, of the client. Uh, uh, let's look at just that. Let's look briefly at two things, the somatic type of, of reconsolidation and um, 
the coherence therapy the, that Bruce Ecker uh, uh, does so beautifully um, and is inherent in CBT, but if you often this homework gets done outside of the, 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 the brain plasticity window. So therefore it becomes extinction rather than reconsolidation. Um, so uh, in Bruce's uh, uh, coherence therapy, it's very simple. What he does is he actually uses what's called the juxtaposing truth. So the red vase, I see the red vase, all these things come up. But actually the truth is uh, that the um, that was a long time ago. That was a past thing. What if I actually am not injured by that vase anymore? And there may be a, a succinct way of putting two or three points, or maybe just one little phrase of this vase is now the memory of the richness of my path and past and the depth of my love uh, for those people close to me. And that I have lost, but I have learned how to regain. It's a positive affirmation, but it's a specific positive truth. It's a reframing of a truth. What we we're shifting from the untrue truth of I am still my house is still burning down, my dog is still dying, my grandfather is still uh, blah 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 blah, to the one that says those things have happened and they have enriched me, or whatever is the truth, uh, uh, whatever is the most. Uh, a pertinent truth and uh bruce says i mean I, i'm oversimplifying because there's a lot more that goes on in the in the the parts so there's still a lot of talk and a lot of engagement that needs to be developed as we see with things like emdr and uh, uh dbt and so on and so forth but you just sort of have that card and you put it in this case we're just using this particular one you'd actually put that near the red vase uh or you might have it in your pocket and uh so you go the red vase and all these things. So, oh, it all comes up. So in that moment, you become labile. That's the time not to get miserable. That's the time to get working. Pull out your card. You read this juxtaposed, um, the juxtaposition. What is the true truth, the, the new truth? And then within, sometimes it can be just once. Sometimes it takes a little period of time because it's, really strongly embedded and you may get rid of a thousand connections on this one and then another thousand connections on the other one because there might be a million or even half a billion connections that are pulling this into a negative experience pulling this 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 trigger of the red vase into a a, a, um, a disturbing dysfunctional experience so you do it until you clear it and this is what they talk about in hypnosis we'll clear that emotional memory i just wish i love the process i get it i just wish the people who were doing it knew what they were doing why they were doing it and how it worked and whether they need to repeat or not repeat and so this is where understanding memory reconsolidation can help you see why the thing you thought was magical and was going to do it in one go actually takes 10 and that that's not a bad thing that actually is just describing the nature of the of the issue. It also might be you might go back and rewrite the card. You might go, yeah, I really understand that now. But now I'm starting to think of, and something else will emerge once you've once you've got that one out of the way. And another way is a more somatic way, and, and beautifully used to Pat Ogden, Peter Levine do this um, describe this lovely. Is what it is is the memory is stuck in the negativity. And what they simply do, one of the simple methods, and NLP has, um, you know, hijacked this and called it theirs. Everyone keeps calling it their own. But anyway, um, it's different from I I am describing a useful human, natural human experience. Because um, uh, you can charge more if it's your own than if it's just a natural human experience. So what they do is saying in this time frame, everything was bad. But can we go, and Solution Focus does this as well. Can we go back before and this uh, before that experience, when everything was okay. And the client can go, oh, yeah. And how about we go here and we go to after the experience when everything was okay. Now, let's reconsolidate. Let's let's review that, that experience from, from okay to okay. That can be a way of doing it. 
Now, some people can't do that visually, sort of imaginatively in there. So you actually take them out and you do it. And you, you, uh, there was a wonderful one of Peter Levine's video he had of a kid that fell out of a, uh, fell off a balcony. And so he had this distress. He's only about eight or nine. So really this cognitive stuff wasn't there. So he built a sort of, with cushions and various things, uh, 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 a sort of a representation of, of the fall. And he had the kid walk along. You're okay there. And then had him fall off onto cushions and things, obviously. Uh, and then get up and mummy and daddy came over and gave him the big hug. So produced it just somatically, which then percolated up into his um, into his mental perceptions. Uh, mirroring hands, the process I, I use. We, we try and uh, uh, differentiate the elements. And this happens in quite a lot of other things. We'll say, okay, let's put all those terrible things over there. So obviously, this is more complex as well over there. So, what are all the good things? And people will spontaneously start saying things like, "Oh, yeah, well, yes, I lost my dog, but I loved my dog, and I love." Oh, yes, that love. So we fo and you focus on that. Um, you can get um, uh, uh, well, and then and then there's a few others, but that's that's three particular forms of um so the mirroring hands is sort of a an open it's a hypnotic type of uh, event so we're looking at opening up the communication between the implicit and the explicit somatic is opening up the implicit and the explicit through a somatic way and the cognitive one um is uh altering these somatic things and so we get a top down reorientation and reframing the other ones are more of a bottom up mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm curious, Richard, like what are you, how do you know a client is in the prime spot for reconsolidation to occur? You know, are you looking for markers on their expression or are they saying, yeah, this feels true on a gut level and this is, or, you know, because I'm, I'm imagining that some people, especially those including myself who can who are pretty good at intellectualizing can have ideas and think and think about trauma and the past and stuff and but it doesn't really experientially shift because i'm just having thoughts about it does that make sense yep and i think here is the we're, we're, we're having drawn you know created the the story and created some of the picture we're now at the crux of uh of what is so interesting and what you and I were talking about before and Niall was so interested in it is how do we use uh, memory reconsolidation? And I hinted at it earlier. You don't. Memory reconsolidation is a natural process. What is the therapist doing? Creating the opportunity and the appropriate circumstances, which is fundamentally what a therapist does on all these natural processes. We are there to turn on and the the most effective personal uh, capacities of the client. So, if you're in a state where the client has, but you've been able to safely recall, uh, bring the, the experience up, and you're not re-traumatizing, because re-traumatizing is reconsolidating the trauma with added weight, because you've you've. So when you recall something, and you feel even worse. That's what's remembered. What I'm saying. So it used to be uh, a, a six out of ten, and after six months of therapy, it's an eight out of ten because they keep re-traumatizing. So there's a variety of ways. I mean, mirroring hands, I love because it externalizes. I'm a great believer in those processes that externalize the process. So visualize, visualize it out here. Gestalt does that sort of stuff. You know, put the trauma in the chair. Um, I've sort of moved to mirroring hands as a gestalt frame, but the gestalt again is a natural one of our natural processes. We can we can objectivize things. So we, when we safely, and each uh, therapist will have their own uh, their own capacities and things that their predilections. But um, uh, uh, just a, a quick warning in there is. Don't just sort of say, go within, bring this, let's go back into the memory. Um, please rethink those processes. Don't go, bring that memory out. Let's put it somewhere safe where we can look at it safely. Um, once you do that, 
the system becomes labile, you're open for reconsolidation. You don't have to do anything. So when is a client ready for reconsolidation? When they have brought themselves back into the into the experience, and the more safely they've been brought back into the experience, the more protected they are from re-experiencing the experience, but the, la- the labile, the lability of the brain still occurs. Now, that stuff that you were saying about you're pretty perceptive, you're looking at the things, the, the, the nuances, the changes, the variations. What you're looking for there is which is the thing that this client is giving me the indication of that they are most likely to be able to utilize successfully to take advantage of the fact that we have now put ourselves in a labile state. So you might be talking to your client saying, now, let's write down some of those ideas. Let's 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 just, uh, doing a bit of a CBT, let's write down some of those beliefs. And they sort of, well, they've already told you, then they pick up the pen and they, right. Well, they're telling you this CBT th- form of process that Aaron Beck beautifully described that you're now using a method that I don't like that. And you you might say, uh, and and then that what do they do? Uh, you keep talking about things. Maybe you move into a couple of different types of. Things. Well, how about we form this this really positive thought like the coherence therapy? And they go, oh yeah, yeah that's. They they sit forward a little bit or their eyebrows lift a little bit. <clears throat> so here we go. Just quickly, eyebrows lift a little bit. What are we doing? We're activating <clears throat> the socially engaged nerves of the face, which we learned from from uh, polyvagal theory when we go and read Steve Porges. you got to know stuff so that your intuition is wiser. What uh, Ernie and I call sensitive observation, which is exactly what you, you were just, that's just a word for the thing you were saying, watching your client and listening to your client. Now, Let's just use a little example, a case, uh, uh, a client of mine who um, had these very traumatic experiences. And <clears throat> over a period of time, we found out there were four, but she only remembered them one at a time. We we had to resolve each one, and then we finally got back and we sort of resolved uh, the whole story. It was fascinating how she said, oh, I feel much better about that, but hey, I had another one just like it. And they were actual near-fatal experiences. And uh, so she was very visual. She was very descriptive. And uh, she would then start using little metaphor images in the way. And it was one was to do with a horse riding incident where she was a a Jim Carner. She was jumping over uh, the things. The horse freaked out. They got wrong. The horse fell. I nearly died. For the rest of her life, she's super protective of herself, of her children. Comes a helicopter mum, all this sort of stuff. Uh, and we used two techniques because she'd be going over saying, oh, and then it was just like, oh, and I remember this dream I had once where I was on the seashore and the, the waves were coming in, but there was a red bubble coming up. Going, okay. So we used a somatic uh, thing, sometimes what NLP, time shifting or various things. So I took her, we visualized taking her back before the horse jumped and then replaying the whole event visually in her head, allowing her to say these metaphors of it. And she was going, oh, yes, and I'm jumping. Oh, yeah, I remember. Oh, now I can feel my body was twisting and my legs were tightening and strengthening. Actually, I was pushing myself off the horse. Oh, I knew this was going on. And the horse was sort of seemed to be throwing its head to throw itself away from me. And then I pushed and we actually landed and it was it was just like a couple of metaphors come out and she then rolled on the ground and got up and she said wow I, i'm all all right and we recovered that and when we went through about the third one of these these and one was with she nearly got shot and it was they were really dramatic and she got to about the third one and she went oh my god i'm not in danger i'm not threatened and constantly um, uh, fearful of my life and fearful of my children, I'm blessed. That was um, Bruce Ecker's 
card. I'm blessed. Now, she didn't have to write it down and remind herself because it came. It took a little while. We had to piece through the horse incident. We had to piece through and reconsolidate the gun incident because what she did in that, she was running. She ran, saw this doorway, ran off to the left. Sadly, her oh, so sad. Her poor girlfriend kept running forward and the stupid teenagers who were mucking about. Anyway, her girlfriend got shot. But she but she realized, oh, my God, I have this intuitive, listen to my intuition, trust myself, reconsolidated. So now these traumatic events remind her of how intuitively blessed she is if she just lets go and stops trying to dominate it. Now, that took a year, uh, not uh, weekly therapy. But she would do something, go off for a couple of months, come back. We'd do three or four sessions. She'd go off, come back. Um, but each time, I knew we were in uh, the opportunity for memory reconsolidation because she was remembering the incident and she was upregulated. I was making it safe by externalizing it and she was making it sta safe by using metaphors. Cool, to, to, so as to, as to not uh, re-traumatize. And, uh, and then just piece by piece, we cleared off the billion connections that made it uh, uh, a post-traumatic uh, disorder and a behavior, a dysfunctional behavioral compensation. Wow, it's so wonderful to hear that type of, of story. It sounds like what you're describing, like with this client and also with the example of the Levine client, the young boy, is there's almost like a, a powered reenactment like a sort of like adding new meanings to these really scary traumatic experiences with like not forcing yourself to just go, well, actually, yeah, I'm strong, but this real sense of feeling like, Oh, I was really smart to do that actually in this case, or like even with the kid, it's like, he's standing up and his parents are there. He's not alone in that falling off the balcony thing. You know, he's like suddenly connected. And I'm wondering if that's the thing, if that's what Bruce would call the juxtaposition of like, Oh yeah. That's right. The, ju the juxtaposition leads to, and you captured it, new meaning, new self-referential context, framework, schema. Uh, the, I'm just throwing in some words that some people might um, have in their particular uh, uh, learning and, and, and study. Uh, in, in systems theory, you change the initial conditions. You alter the, the context of the attractors and the disruptors. You, um, you shift from a negative feedback loop into a positive feedback loop. Uh, for those that understand systems theory, you alter those three things, boom, solved. How is it solved? Neurobiologically, we reconsolidate into a new architectural framework of associations, intensities, and relevance. So fundamentally, uh, what uh, Bernie uh, talked about, although it's been around, Wallace talked about it in the early 20s, what we call the four-stage creative cycle is that we start out with information. We seek to make that information personally relevant. We have some kind of breakthrough that we go, that's what the relevance is. Then we creatively install that and and create elements to, to work with that uh, that breakthrough. Then we implement it into our lifestyle, into our, in, into our experience. That's actually true of everything. It's true of the, how genes work and atoms work and universes work, but that four-stage creative cycle. So if you have an experience that you think, oh, my God, what this means to me is that everything is terrible, and then, oh, that's because I'm a bad person and there's something wrong with me and I'll never recover, I now then go off and create all these um, uh uh, validations of that new that new belief, and then I implement it in my life, and I'm post traumatic stress disorder. I have that experience. I then go, yeah, and that I, you know, you do that. Oh my gosh, you're never going to recover. No, reconsolidate memory reconsolidation. The nature's already figured this out. You can't live like that. So it says we can go back and re-experience it, reframe the meaning and the personal context have a new realization like my beautiful people uh, one with the horse my gosh i'm not doomed i'm blessed then you recreate 
a whole bunch of associations and relevance and frames and and future actions of what I'm going to do next. And then you consolidate that into the uh, your new life and away you go. Now, that could occur in one session. That could occur in 20. That could occur watching a film. Uh, as we saw with the house thing, it could be the metaphor of a chip packet rolling across the pavement that just gets you on the day. Extra therapeutic sources, as we say. And that final thing to remind the therapists that in the, the particularly the recent, more recent work of, of common factors, that up to 80 to 90% of what happens in therapy is based on the capacities of the client and the extra therapeutic uh, opportunities that come about. But what we do in our little, it seems a little bit, but if you think in systems, our little bit is the thing that absolutely changes everything. You put that tiny drop of color and that completely changes the color of, of the whole experience. So our job is not to be the amazing um, healer. Our job is to be the totally cooperative, co-creative, integrator, observer, noticer, and contributor to the client's natural capacities. My woman doing the metaphors and the images, don't do CBT on her. It's a waste of time. Thing. But if someone's very rational and very organized, um, yeah, let's try some CBT or let's try some solution focused. Let's try some top-down processes. Who is your client? What are they doing? Memory reconsolidation, it will do what it does without you. It doesn't need you to exist and function. We create the opportunity and the appropriate circumstances. Wonderful. I love it. Um, I feel like I've got so many more questions, but I'm conscious of our time coming to a close. Could yeah. you, um, for people wanting to really understand the nuts and bolts of this can you point people to resources like people that kind of thing sure uh, i mean certainly uh, uh, bruce's book unlocking the emotional uh, brain uh, with um with with uh, robin tissick and uh, lauren hurley is is great goes through there then he has his coherence therapy which you may or may not um uh, resonate with but that's a terrific one certainly in the uh, the, the the uh aqua turquoise book the the practitioner's guide to the science of psychotherapy we give some a, a few descriptions but also a number of other things we talk about memory i mean we're all talking about this i mean that beautiful thing uh, unlocking the emotional brain what are emotions half the time we don't even know what they are you know where they come from um so we've got joseph ledoux uh look at his work uh, well I, I think i've got a i've got a few papers here um here was one uh, I think 2013 uh, with um, uh, Christina Alberini. Uh, uh, and um, anyway, so read some of these sorts of things and do that, you know, do your highlighting. Uh, we've got, uh, there's lots and lots of, of websites. Get into, get into some of the biology. Don't drive yourself nuts. But the reason why we reconsolidate is because we become labile and we have a reactivation of gene expression so there are new proteins so it actually rebuilds the structure it literally rebuilds the structure brain brain plasticity is not some magical sort of things just flopping around it's like plastic it's where we get one structure and we create a new one through gene expression uh ernest rossi the psychobiology of gene expression that'll that'll um, drive you crazy uh, but that that's that's quite useful different techniques i mean mirroring hands and and and, and my one, people can come and learn about the win or loser world, how the, the these mindsets of orientation. Um, uh, there's a bunch. There's a bunch just, just off the top of my head. There are a lot of people talking about a lot of things. Look at therapeutic processes and go, they've had an insight. Any process where they've had an insight, go, okay, that's memory reconsolidation happening there. Where's, where, where was it? Where did... Where did the event come out and where were the mechanisms that enabled them to uh, enable the client to have that new breakthrough, that personal meaning, that personal relevance and, and the breakthrough? And how can I and do I do that? And where do I do that? Look at your own clients. So in other words, don't 
apply memory reconsolidation, look for when they are in a consolidating frame, a labile context, that they're safely in the recall of the experience and do it then. Find the, find the appropriate mechanism for that client then. Now, if you're not sure what the client is, is most attuned to, just do any one of those. Do, do a, 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 a coherence therapy. Do a, 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 a reproduction. Do, do the rewind technique in NLP. Um, now, it may or may not be uh, completely effective. As I said, with my woman with the four experiences, it was different each time we went through each experience, but we used the same context. We used the same mechanisms, but one went a bit this way. One went. A, one went, was just all imagery. We didn't do any um, uh, experiential re uh, or re-experiencing. It was just all. She had this um, dream, and she had this image, and that was the the whole process. So yeah, be flexible, be knowledgeable, be so much in reverence of the client's capacities that you wish to be in tune with them. I love that. I wrote that down before, actually, when you were um, talking about um, meeting, almost meeting the client with where they're at and not trying to force a particular technique that you're familiar with down their throat. Like, oh, this is this is what I'm trained in. So this is what we got to do. It's more like, well, what's the thing that's going to help this particular client reconsolidate this memory or this stuff rather than no here's that worksheet this is the thing we've got to do which i think is really empowering for the the client yeah. to be met in that way well um, it's very hard to appreciate the fact that every single thing that you've learned at, at college at university i've done what have i done three master's degrees i'm now doing a phd because i'm an idiot <laughs> or because i'm clever but every single thing you've learned when you're sitting there with the client in front of you is about somebody else. And just remember that, that none of those things are necessarily specifically about this person who's sitting in front of you, but they contribute to your understanding and your capacity to see this person. Uh, more than meeting them, see them, understand them. That was the, we were talking before, we didn't mention, but I was an actor for 20 years. When I was acting, I didn't meet my character. I as best I could, found the character within my own uh, resonance with that character within my own capacities and abilities. Now, that won't make you exactly like the client and you're not doing the client, you're not taking on the stuff, but you can start to resonate with the client. They're already committed to resonating to you. They've come, they've walked, they've sat down, they've paid some money. They're ready to resonate with you. You need to be ready to resonate with them. I love it. I think that's a brilliant place to end our time together. Thank you so much, Richard. I'm, I'm sure there's so much more. This is such a nuanced, um, complex thing, despite us all having the uh, capacity to do it. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your time. Any any final nuggets of wisdom before we depart? I don't know. That was pretty nifty. I thought that, that my wife says I'm good at these hand-waving things at the end of a, 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 of a speech. Um, <clears throat> Keep learning, keep investigating. I mean, uh, come and see, you know, my contributions and Matt's, the science of psychotherapy.net. Uh, come and see Richard Hill, uh, you know, .com.au. I'm doing a series of um, free webinars through the year as I as I try and get the Americans to notice me, but through a group called collectivelyrooted.com. Uh, and they're the guys that uh, uh, Bessel van der Kolk and Janina, uh, Janina, I know Janina. Anyway, so I'm sort of in that stable, um, uh, a little less known, but hopefully more. Uh, check me out, but check other people out. Joseph Ledoux, gosh, it's his last book, The Stages of Consciousness, Four Billion Years, the last two books. Uh, I love Joseph. He's just so brilliant. Uh, Robert Sapolsky, if you want to get into the behavioral, into the the, the anthropological. Um, look at the stuff that's that seems hard, and don't worry about the stuff that's hard. Look for the stuff that resonates with you uh, because that, guess what? It will reconsolidate your your intellectual and your knowledge base and your orientation. What a wonderful way to, to loop it back at the end. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, and we'll put links to like Collectively Rooted and the Science of Psychotherapy in the 
in the description. But yeah, Richard, thank you so much for your time. Um, and yeah, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Beautiful. And it's been a great pleasure for me. And anyway, uh, we love Nylon and, and uh, uh, happy to do anything that, that helps his work. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you.